All right, so I take this medallion and I swing it around at a constant speed. What I've got is uniform circular motion. Now, if the string is one unit in length, we can say that the position of the bit on the end is cos theta sine theta. But if that isn't the case, if the length of my string is longer, let's just say r, then the position of this point is r cos theta, r sine theta. Now, we can create a vector equation for this point, right? Something like this. Now, the displacement of our object is equal to r cos theta i plus r sine theta j. Now, you can think of this as two periodic functions. The cos curve here gives you the x-coordinates position at any given time. So, you can see at, at time 0, the x-coordinate would be whatever r is. That's r there, and this is negative r here. And it would move up until we get to the 90-degree point, at which point the x-coordinate of that dot would be 0, and then negative r, and then 0 again, and then r again. Whereas the y-coordinate starts off at 0, no height, and then up to uh, r, and then back down to a height of 0, and then back down to uh, negative r, and then back to a height of 0. So we have two periodic functions for the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate that come from something like this. Now, of course, in terms of our vector function, we can factorise this, make it a little bit neater. So just uh, cos theta i plus sine theta j, because they're both being multiplied by r. Now, just be really careful here. This is the displacement vector, r, the vector, but this is the radius of our circle. All right, so uh, where to next? Well, look at this function here. This is our uh, vector uh, with respect to theta, the angle, right? But this doesn't tell us anything about the speed at which I am spinning that thing. Maybe I'm spinning it quite slowly, but maybe I'm spinning it faster. Now, if I'm spinning it slowly or if I'm spinning it faster, what happens to these graphs is that if it's spinning fast, the graph pushes in like this. The period of our graph changes. And you've dealt with periodic functions before. You know what you have to do when a period changes. So putting on your maths methods hat for a second, if f of x equals sine b theta, then the period is equal to 2 pi over b. Uh, now what this means is that we can generate a slightly different, more useful displacement uh, vector function here. So writing our function in terms of t now, we can say that the displacement is equal to r cos omega, that's not a w, omega t i plus sine omega t j. Okay, uh, I just need to tidy this up a little bit, tell you a little more about this omega thing. Now, omega is equal to uh, the rate of change of the angle uh, with respect to time. And this is future me, about 10 minutes in the future, coming back to further explain this a little bit. Now, this is a rate, and the way that we measure it is in radians per second. So imagine for a moment that something was moving at one radian per second. It would look a little bit like this like this. It would have moved one radian, approximately 58 point something degrees, around that circle in one second. Now remember one radian is equal to the length of the radius around the diameter, right? Um, so that means that if this circle is, say, uh, has a radius of 10, then it moved 10 meters in one second. If this radius, ha if this circle has a radius of 2, then it moved 2 meters in one second. This leads to something that you really need to know. Speed around the circle equals the radius times omega. Uh, a very quick example. An object moves with angular velocity. Okay, this is angular velocity. Three radians per second around a circle with radius five meters. Find its speed. So it's speed around the circle. Now, if it's moving at three radians per second, that moves it's moved one, two, three, it should be a bit longer than that, but you get the idea, one, two, three radians. Now each of those radians would have, if we length five, so five, 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 and that's where our little formula comes from here. We can say that the speed of this object, the speed at which it's traveling, is equal to the radius of the circle, five, times its angular velocity, three radians per second, equals 15. 
Now, normally when you get a question like this, it would kind of be a bit in reverse. An object moves at 10 meters per second around a circle of radius 2, find omega, and we can just put it into this same formula. So the speed this time is 10, that's equal to the radius of the circle times omega, which means that omega in this case is equal to 5 radians per second. Okay, uh, that was a big bit, but it's it's pretty important that you really dive deep into what um, angular velocity omega really means, how it's working. Now, there is another way to explain all of this that's a bit more vector calculusy, but I wanted to draw on what you already knew about when it comes to periodic functions. All right, so this function that we have here is really, really useful because if we have, like, if we knew the value here and we knew the value here, and you knew the time as well, you can just plug those values in and you can find where exactly around this circle our point is. We'll find out what our i coordinate is and we'll find out what our j coordinate is. Uh, really useful displacement function. Now, obviously, we're talking about vector calculus. So if we derive our displacement function, we'll get a velocity function. Now, I'll write it down there in a second, but let's just work it out really quickly. I've expanded uh, this so that the r's are back in there. Now, if I take the derivative of this, uh, we bring the w out. Uh, we end up, oh, sorry, the omega out. Uh, cos becomes negative sine, and we're left with omega t there, i, plus, and then here, we bring the w out, w, oh, sorry, omega, r, uh, cos, omega t, j. And you can see that we've got uh, omega r as a common factor there, so we can bring omega r out, and we'll be left with this. r omega, negative sine omega t, i, plus cos omega t, j. Okay, this is really useful. This gives us our velocity both in the i component and in the j component here. But it also gives us something useful as well. Now, before I talk about that other useful thing, what is this doing? Well, imagine that we were spinning our object again, spinning our object, and then we were to let it go. Maybe it's like a hammer throw, right? Because you're spinning a hammer around and you let it go. Where does it go? Well, if we were to let this go at this moment, and it was spinning in this direction, like that, when we let it go, it's going to fly off here at a tangent right? Now, if we knew the uh, magnitude of this, we'd know how fast it was going. Uh, now, we can also determine the direction that our hammer throw would be going in from this function as well. But that's what we're determining. We're determining a tangent to our circle at that instant and how long that function, that velocity is, how fast it's moving. Now, how are we going to find out how fast it's moving? You might be looking at this function and thinking it's getting a bit long, it's getting a bit crazy. Luckily, there's a little trick here. Look here. Negative sine WTI cos WTJ. This and this. This is the Y bit here, this length here. And this is this bit here, but without the R. This is a unit vector, right? Length one, because the r's on the outside here. So this is just a unit, this is just involved with a unit circle here. All right, so uh, if we add that and that, we get a unit vector, which means that that's just the number one, which means that the velocity is the magnitude of the entire thing, but that thing is just one, which means that the velocity is just the absolute value of this bit here. So we've got a couple of things now. We've got a displacement function, probably that one there looks good. We've also got a velocity function, which gives you the velocity in the i and j components. How fast is it moving that way? And how fast is it moving up and down? Now, you just need to think about this for a second. When it comes to a circle, if an object is here, at that instant, at that instant, it's not moving left or right it's just moving straight up. So the velocity is all in this direction here, all in the J component. If an object is here, uh, it's not moving up or down at that instant. So all of its velocity is in the left and right, or in the left if it's turning this way, direction. 
it's these instances here that are interesting because there's a component of its velocity in the x part or in the i component and there's a component of its velocity in the j. It's moving some speed towards the left and some speed upwards at that instant. And that's what that tells us. This is what that, that function tells us. We finally have this little bit here, which is the velocity, the actual magnitude of the velocity of that tangent at that instant. Now we can come up with an acceleration function as well. And doing that is just deriving our velocity function. Now remember, this is our velocity function here. It just hasn't been, oops, it just hasn't been factorized like it was there. All right, so we bring our w out. We're going to end up with negative w squared r. The sine becomes cos omega t. It's omega. All right, and finally, uh, this bit here. Cos becomes negative sine, the W comes out, so we get W squared, but negative, so I don't need that plus there, R sine omega T. It's always omega, it's never W. All right, and we get that here, and you can see we have a common factor here, so we can bring that out as well. Let's put it there. And we get this nice uh, acceleration function here, RW squared, negative, uh, R omega squared, uh, negative cos omega t i minus sine omega t j. And that will give us our acceleration at any given moment in the i coordinate and in the j coordinate. And of course, if we wanted to know just the magnitude of the acceleration, we could do that as well, just with that r, w, r, r omega squared just there. Finally, I just want to make sure that I'm not assuming something here. Time to complete one revolution. So the time it takes to get from here all the way around to here is 2 pi on omega. Same as when we were talking about those periodic functions before. The time it takes for a periodic function to repeat is really the time it takes for it to get around a circle. The period is equal to 2 pi on omega. That can be useful for a lot of circular motion questions because you'll generally be able to figure out or they'll ask you to figure out how long it takes something to get around that circle, one revolution. All right, uh, I'm going to do another video here where we actually do a question when it comes to circular motion, but there are our basic ideas. What do you need to take away from this? You need to know about this displacement function. You definitely need to know about uh, this velocity function and this handy little shortcut for finding the magnitude of the velocity there. And you also really need to know the acceleration function there. And you need to be able to jump from, from one to the other. Uh, you're also going to need to know that uh, omega is the change in the angle with respect to time. And really important that you understand that the period is equal to 2 pi over omega.